Your Creative Push, episode 53. You gotta really believe in yourself. You have to have confidence in what you're doing. Nobody else is gonna have confidence for you. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is JT Ellison. JT is the New York Times bestselling author of 15 critically acclaimed novels, including What Lies Behind, When Shadows Fall, and All the Pretty Girls, and is the co-author of the Nicholas Drummond series with the number one New York Times bestselling author, Katherine Coulter. With over a million books in print, Ellison's work has been published in 25 countries and 13 languages. Her novel, The Cold Room, won the ITW Thriller Award for Best Paperback Original. Now, JT, I love your story because you came from kind of a different background and transitioned. Could you tell us about your time in D.C.? Sure. Um, I went to high school in D.C. I moved from Colorado when I was 14, and it was complete and utter culture shock. Uh, I did not fit in at all. This was a little mountain girl coming to the big city. Um, but I got bit by the, by the political bug. It's kind of hard not to. And so when I went to college, I double majored in both English creative writing and politics. And we'll get into why I went into politics a little bit later, but I did. And my first job out of college was in the White House, which was really, really fun. And, you know, being a 21 year old and being that close to the seat of power was, was very, very fascinating. Um, I was a glorified team maker and wrote white papers. You know, I was just a kid. I didn't get to do anything really exciting, but it was a, it was a really interesting place to, to start a career. And of course, you know, when, when you get a, and I got a master's degree in political management from George Washington. And I really thought that was the path I was going to take. And I, uh, you know, I think everybody goes to DC thinking they're going to change the world. And there is a balance of power there that you either have to choose to accept or you have to walk away from. And, and I walked away from it because I didn't feel like it was the right fit for me. The way you have to kind of bend yourself, uh, your morals, your values, things that you think you're very black and white on, there are a lot of shades of gray in DC. And I just wasn't comfortable with it. So I walked away from it. Now, you said that like people get sucked into it. What do, what do you mean by that? Well, it's, it's power, right? And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. There's no, no mistaking that. If you watch House of Cards, yeah. it's a really, really accurate view of how some people in D.C. work. And uh, I, just, I just couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. I'm, I'm way too straightforward about things. I'm not good at hiding things. I've got a glass face. I'm just not, I'm just not that person, you know, and I was very idealistic and thought I was going to be able to change the world and found very quickly. That's not what happens. Yeah. I just, uh, that's very interesting to me because um, I used to be a professional poker player and now I'm a poker dealer, Okay, but it's, I think there's a lot of similarities there because there I, I have a huge guilty conscience. So it would, <laughs> Like it took years to actually get over that uh, of like feeling bad about taking other people's money, where that's the actual goal of poker is to take other people's money. Sure. But um, yeah, and the just the negative energy which I'm feeling right now, um, in my job is like I feel like I need to get away from it, and this podcast is like a great outlet from getting away from this negative like whirlpool that you can just kind of fall into and and start to become very negative yourself. And I I totally resonate with that idea of you know you have to get out before it's too late before it's too late yeah. it, i mean no you're absolutely right and and poker is an excellent analogy for that too because that's you know you have to look somebody in the eye and and lie right or mislead let's say let's let's be let's be more accurate you have to look them in the eye and mislead them right and you know it takes a certain kind of person to be able to do that for sure and i think people can change but it's the cost of you know your soul i guess <laughs> I don't know. I think I think you have to be willing to, you know, 
uh, compromise a lot. And if you're willing to do that, and, and trust me, there are phenomenal people in DC who are not crooked and who are doing everything right, of course. the right way. And, you know, I just bumped into a few that weren't and it really freaked me out because I saw how easy it could be to fall into that trap. Yeah. Well, let's get away from this negative energy. Yeah. And, uh, Ooh, go away. Let's go away. <laughs> let's get back into creativity. Um, can you take us back to maybe um, one of your first creative moments, uh, whether it was writing or anything else? Sure. I always wrote. I always wrote. Um, but I think the best example of just an absolute victory was uh, the first time I sat down to write after I had been away from it for eight years. I had gone into politics and, and been away from writing. I didn't write. I did nonfiction, speech writing, and that kind of stuff. But I didn't do any creative writing. And I had been casting about for a long time, trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. Um, we had moved to Nashville. I couldn't find a job. My cat died. I mean, it was just like this. I was, I was like a country music song there for a while. <laughs> And we we adopted a new- <laughs> No, it's true though. <laughs> yeah. No. We we adopted a new cat and she was sick and we took her to the vet and the vet was looking for somebody to work there. And I, I couldn't find a job. I was new to town. I figured, okay, I'm just gonna do this. I'll sit at the front desk, I'll meet people, it'll be great. And he actually wanted me to work as a vet tech which meant behind the scenes, which meant doing some really disgusting things. Oh, behind those just, doors. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I, I sure. couldn't do it. And so the th- I was going to quit on Friday. And on Wednesday, I picked up a dog and herniated a disc in my back and ended up having to have back surgery. Hmm. And while I was recovering, I went to the library and I said, hey, listen, I'm looking for you know good crime fiction. And they suggested John Sanford. And I was three books into the series when it just kind of hit me. And I was like, I have to do this. I have to do this. And I sat down and I started to write and I wrote a paragraph and I started to cry. Mm. I hit period and I started to cry because that was it. I had come home. It Mm. was the most amazing feeling. And then my husband came home that night and I told him what I had done. And he kind of looked at me and he goes, well, if you're going to do it, do it right that was it. And I kind of took off from that moment. I haven't looked back. Mm, I, lo- I love that. And I just got chills <laughs> with that story. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people listening um, can definitely relate to that because that, you know, the idea of that eight year gap that you had um, where you're not, kind of not even thinking about it. Maybe you kind of are thinking about it, but you have to like push it away because you don't have time for it because of, you know, your current job. Right. What would you suggest to somebody who kind of is in that long-term lull from their creative hobby, whatever it is. And what advice would you give to them to kind of come back home? To, to just do it. Yeah. To just do it. I mean, it's so hard. Uh, you know, the whole time I was working at a career and I'm putting little quotes around the word working, um, <laughs> something was wrong. And yeah, I was good at what I did, but I hated every minute of it. I hated getting up in the morning. I hated going to work. I hated going to sleep at night because it meant I had to get up again and do it the next day. And, and if you're feeling that you need to step away, life is just too short to be miserable in your work and what you do. Um, writing isn't easy. It is not an easy path. Um, there are a lot of obstacles in the way. But any creative outlet, if whether you're a writer or a painter or, or a poet or, uh, you know, any kind of artist, whatever, you have to just do it. And you can't let anybody else tell you that you're not going to make money at it or it's a waste of your time or why are you doing this as a hobby? You know, if you want it, you got to go get it. Nobody's going to give it to you. I love it. And so you would suggest just full out figuring out a different path and not just kind of slowly incorporating it? Uh, Well, you know, if you have the financial means to just, you know, all stop and go in a different direction, great. Most people don't. Um, The people that I know that I respect the most who uh, wanted this and had a career or had a job or had another, you know, had kids, had a full-time gig that they couldn't get out of, right? They got up an hour early every day and wrote for an hour. Hmm. They went to bed an hour late 
and wrote for an hour. They went out to lunch by themselves and they wrote for an hour. You write for an hour a day. And let's, let's just, you know, kind of keep this on writing, painting, yeah. what, music, whatever. You know, take an hour out of your life. You can find an hour to do anything and just do it. I mean, if you want to look at just basic economics of writing, right? If you can write 250 words in 15 minutes, you can have 70,000 words of a novel in a year. Wow. 15 wow. minutes a day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, an hour is better, but 15 minutes a day, write 250 words. You will have a novel by the end of the year. It's doable. It is totally doable. Yeah. And it's all about that, you know, the, the, the baby steps every single day and they really do accumulate. It's all about just doing that, that thing every single day and making a habit of it. Well, I mean, that's the thing that a professional writer has in common with a yet to be published writer is they're sitting down and doing it every single day. I mean, it's just not, books just don't appear overnight. They take time. They take time and effort and energy. And I mean, I would say, it, more than half of my writer friends have jobs and they, you know, this is, they do this when they find the time, they carve it out and they make it happen because they want it. Yeah. And uh, going back to what you're saying as well about, you know, finding the time, I think a lot of people kind of want to have that time kind of fall in their lap and then they're sure. like, okay, I'll do it. But yeah, it really is about grinding it out and just kind it of sac sacrificing some sa it sacrificing is. one TV show that you watch every week or a an hour of sleep a day. If you get used to it, I think it could it could work. What's fascinating to me is, you know, people know how to budget, right? You want to go on vacation. So for six months, instead of going to Starbucks, you put that $4 in a jar and then you've got enough money at the end of six months to go on your vacation, right? Right. But they don't think about that in terms of creativity. And it, it's the same thing. If you just budget out that little bit of time every single day to touch your manuscript, touch your work, try, it, it all adds up. Now... Are there any other things uh, aside from, you know, time that maybe held you back in the past or were a form of resistance <laughs> to you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all have our, our dragons. But my biggest one was, uh, you know, I had uh, I mentioned earlier the path um, that I ended up taking with politics. And the reason why I did that, I really wanted to go get an MFA, uh, Master of Fine Arts and be a writer. That's what I wanted. And I, you know, did everything. I wrote everything. I read everything. And, and my senior thesis, my professor told me, she said, listen, you're just not good enough to get published. What? So I quit. I quit. This was a college professor that said yes, that? Yes. It was my thesis advisor. I quit. I quit writing because I respected her. And when she said that, I believed her. Uh, so that's why I didn't write for eight years because somebody told me I wasn't good enough. And I tell the story to, to groups now and they say, well, you know, surely you, you wrote just to prove her wrong. I'm like, no, <laughs> right. you know, and if that was her goal, if her goal was some reverse psychology to make me write harder. Yeah, that didn't work. I, I walked away, just completely walked away. And even, know, even knowing that that wasn't the right thing to do immediately. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. I had a really fun, everything happens for a reason. I met my husband the first night of grad school. So I, that was the path I was meant to take so I could find him, um, which I don't regret any of that for a second. And back then, I probably wasn't good enough to get published. But back then, not a lot of people were publishing right out of college. That trend has changed with the advent of young adults and how incredibly uh, educated these young writers are who are coming up. Um, they're publishing much, much earlier than my cohort did. But uh, yeah, it's um, I, I call that a pretty big pile of resistance right there. That's a hard Absolutely. voice to get out of your head. Oh, for sure. That's a hard voice. And I hear her all the time. So you're not the first person who says something like this, which is just kind of shocking to me. Ronnie Allen, a, a writer who was on the show before, um, you know, but hers was from, I believe, middle school. Um, like a teacher slammed down a paper on her, on her desk and said, you write like a four-year-old or something. Oh, like, <laughs> how, how, what are these teachers and professors doing? Like, that's so detrimental, especially if you're 
you know, you're writing a thesis. This is, this is a serious deal to you, you know, like, uh, I can't, oh, yeah. oh, that angers me so much. Or just give creative criticism. You know, you're not good enough to be published yet, you know, yes. and here's what you can do sure. to fix it. Let's, let's really work on this if this is something you want to do. Uh, I, so what would you suggest to somebody to, to get over that? Cause I, you know, I think that's a big thing for a lot of people is, they get one negative comment and it just completely wipes away like a sure. hundred or a thousand positive comments. It's that sure. one voice, like you said in your head, how do you get rid of that voice? You have to purposefully block it out. You, your critical voice, you know, it's the front of your brain. It's, it's that voice that holds you back from everything that you want to do. You have to rediscover the joy of what you're doing. You have to revamp what your goals are. If you've only ever been writing to get published and somebody's saying, hey, you know, you're not good enough. Okay. Take a step back and assess that. Take it seriously. Do you agree? Well, if you agree, then you need to find a way to improve your craft, right? You need to study some of the masters. You need to read. I mean, you need to read in your genre. That's everybody says, Oh, I don't read when I'm writing. Yeah, that's crazy. You <laughs> have to read. Um, know who's getting published, know how they're getting published, know why. If you can understand why a story is appealing on a broad level, you can fix your own. Go to a, go to a workshop, go to a conference, do anything, find a critique group, find somebody who can help and, and not tear you down while they're doing it. Um, if you want it bad enough, I mean, anybody can be taught to write. What, what separates people out is voice. Voice can't be taught. Voice is something unique to every writer. And voice is something that comes when you trust yourself. So if you learn how to write, learn how to structure, learn how to build a story, and then let yourself go, the voice will come. Yeah. And that voice develops from, you know, putting in the time, as we said. Practice. It does. Yeah. It comes from practice. And and the good thing about finding a group and finding, you know, a partner, a writing partner or somebody who you can trust, um, you also have that kind of reliability it's one thing to have your own voices in your own head telling you what's good and what's bad, but having the other set of eyes not only helps, but it helps inspire you to, to write, you know, because oh, somebody else is doing it with you. When I was just starting out, um, I got into a critique group and I had to bring 10 new pages every two weeks. And the idea of now I've, I'm, you know, a little bit driven, but the idea of showing up without new pages Hmm. And I had 10 new pages every two weeks, no matter what. And, you know, again, that went to the practice that went to, you know, they taught me a lot. They pointed out what was working and what wasn't working. You can't see the forest for the trees when you're inside of a story. And that's, you know, that's, that's good. That's fine. That's why you need somebody else to, to take a look at it and say, hey, okay, here's what's working for me. And here's what's not. And then you go from there. Absolutely. Um, could you take us back to and tell us your worst moment or your hardest time when, you know, resistance really kicked your butt? Sure. 2011. I thought I was going to quit. I actually thought I was going to quit. Things had not gone the way I wanted. Um, with the past couple of books, I'd lost my editor, um, who was really had been a huge champion. She she left the company and, you know, I was orphaned and I didn't have an editor for a couple of months while they were trying to figure out what to do. And my, my book came out and it didn't do all that great. And, you know, it just felt like I had hit a huge wall. We were having issues, personal issues that were, you know, totally getting in the way, um, really getting in the way. And nothing worked. Nothing felt right. Everything I wrote felt stilted and I was, I was bored with it. And I decided, you know, I got to do something here. And so I, I picked up Julia Cameron's The Artist Way. Hmm. And I did that book religiously. I did every step. I did the morning pages. I, I took it really seriously and really worked through what I was doing. And I, I came out the other side of it saying, you know, a bad day writing is better than a good day doing anything else. <laughs> so yes, I want to be a writer. Yes, I want to keep moving forward. 
what I want to do is change what I'm writing. That's what the problem was. I had written eight books in a row with the same characters and I was bored. I needed to try something else. That's when we spun off Sam Owens into a different series. And then I had a whole new world to build and I got really excited about writing again. And so now I've realized, you know, when I'm starting to feel those levels of dissatisfaction, I just need to change projects. I just need to try something, you know, just go to a different world. And, you know, uh, I think a lot of writers hit that moment and they don't know what it is. They don't know what that resistance is and they walk away. And, you know, if you take the time to really dig down and find out what's going on, then, then you can work through it. And I ended up using, you know, I've got three books in a row about loss that are, you know, actually kind of hard to read. I'm reading one of them right now because I'm, I'm getting ready to resurrect the characters um, for a new book here six years later and or six books later excuse me and it, it, oh wow it's hard to read that because I remember where I was when I wrote it mm. but you know that's the gift of being a writer is you can actually work through your own nonsense as well absolutely it's a form of therapy for sure sure I had never used it for that and and I did and it worked um, what would you suggest to somebody who, you know, is maybe at that point that you're talking about that doesn't quite know how to pivot and and switch to something new? What advice would you give to them to be able to kind of start with something fresh? Well, the first thing I would say is don't leave a half eaten sandwich behind. <laughs> that's, that's Just a waste of call, food. That's what we call stories that don't ever come to fruition. We call them half eaten sandwiches. I have a lot of those. Yeah, a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, because you get into the trench with it and either the story isn't working or you get bored by it or, you know, oh, shiny object. And, you know, shiny. you magpie <laughs> yeah. over to another thing. And, you know, it's very easy to, to lose your focus on the story. Um, it's, a you know, spending a year with the story is a really long time to spend. You know, it's, it's something you have to get used to. You know, yeah, you get bored. Yeah, you get sick of it. I have a whole writer's journey that I go through, you know, oh, I hate this. Oh, I love it. Oh, I hate this. Oh, I love it. You know, every, oh, yeah. every story has its own thing. So you've got to figure out if you're walking away because you're bored or you're walking away because something is structurally wrong. If something is structurally wrong, you need to fix it. If you're just bored by what you're writing, ugh, you know, examine why that is. Why are you bored? Have you lost confidence in yourself or has somebody, you know, made one of those little sideways comments to you? Uh, you know, when I, when I first started out, everybody, for some reason, thought I was writing children's books. <laughs> They're like, oh, so you read children's stories with that, you know, that kind of just complete condescension in, in their voice. And it was just like, probably I'm without reading head. anything too, right? No, no, they had no idea. And I'm like, yeah. no, I'm not writing, you know, not that there's yeah. anything wrong with that, but no, that's not what I'm doing. And there was something about the way they would just, it was so dismissive yeah, that it just drove me crazy. And that really, I used that anger to keep me going. Because I really wanted to show those people that were like, oh, so you're writing children's stories. And they do that, you know, uh, you know, oh, you're writing romance. Oh, you're writing genre. You know, it's like, yeah, what the hell have you written? What the hell have you written? And <laughs> what is your damage? You know, I'd like to see you sit down and do this for a year and see what you produce. You know, so, so yeah. anything can derail you. Anything from big problems to little ones can derail you. And, you know, if you are being derailed, you have to look at why you have to look at why and you have to be honest with yourself. The, the problem with being a writer is it takes a lot of introspection. You have to navel gaze and say, you know, why am I doing this? Do I have what it takes? Do I believe in myself? You have to have a huge ego to think that you can write a story that people are going to pay you to read. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta really believe in yourself. You have to have confidence in what you're doing. Nobody else is going to have confidence for you. Yeah, you just have to, as you said, just find that inner confidence and just ig ignore people. Almost, you know, like, yeah. like just trust that they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you just can't, you know, from a one-star review 
on Amazon to your, your spouse who's, you know, kind of like, Hey, why aren't we going out tonight? You know, you got to work again. Uh, anything can derail you and you have to respect your time. And if you respect your time and you respect your work, other people will as well. And then all of that gets easier. For sure. And you got to just see the end goal as well. I, I have that as well with the spouse thing. <laughs> my wife, uh, God bless her, because all my free time has been devoted to this podcast now. So it, it does take an, a certain amount of patience and you have to be, um, you just have to really love what you're doing and, and see the end of it, you know, see the end goal. Like I'm creating this for this reason, because it brings this to my life. And, you know, we'll kind of figure out life after, you know. Yeah. Well, all creatives are selfish. Yeah. Um, and you have to be, you have to be selfish. You have to be able to respect your time and, and, you know, all of that. And what's really intelligent is to sit down with the person who, you know, is having an issue with it and, and be honest with them about your level of dissatisfaction with what you're doing and why you're doing this and what it's going to mean for you, how it's going to enhance their life you being happy is going to make their life way happier. True. There's, also, there's also, you know, it's very, very threatening for the spouse of a creative, the parent of a creative to, to see you finding satisfaction in something that's not them. Hmm. That's a really hard thing for the person who, who you're sharing all of your time with, that you're getting so much joy and satisfaction out of something that has nothing to do with them. So the person you're with has to be really secure and hopefully have their thing that they love that makes them happy. I mean, you have to be able to make yourself happy. You can't have somebody else that, that makes you happy for you. And you know, that's always something, you know, to be paying attention to because that's that's probably the number one thing that derails creatives is the people they love not understanding how much they need to do this. Yeah, you nailed it. That's <laughs> such good advice. And yeah, it's it's almost like whatever your creative thing is, it's almost like not an affair, but it's like it's like a relationship that you have. Yeah, you have to put in time with it and <laughs> like nurture that relationship as well. So that's I don't know. It's it's definitely good advice. And to as you said to make sure that you're open with, you know, wh whoever it is, if it's your, you know, parent, your um, spouse, your girlfriend, whatever, your dog. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever is going to, you know, miss you while you're gone, they have to understand why you're driven to do it and that it's not that, you know, they make you very happy and it is not a dissatisfaction with them that drives you to create. Hugely important. Absolutely. All right, JT, now it's time for the final push. And this is where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of somebody you've already really inspired today and use your best advice and push them into action. So I think there are two words that you need to, you know, if you need to tattoo it on your arm, if you need to write it on a post-it note and stick it to your computer, two words, two words that you need to remember, reckless abandon. You have to sit down and approach the page with reckless abandon. You have to shut off everybody else, turn off all the other voices, and just create. Take the editor out, take the critic out, take your English teacher from, you know, who <laughs> told you you wrote like a four year old, take out that person who said you were never going to be good enough to get published. Tell them, you know, t take them out of your head, sit them in a nice glass jar and put a little top on it so they can't get out. All right. So they're visually, literally visually gone from you. And then just create. Give yourself permission to enjoy what you're doing, to tell the story and and have fun with it. This is supposed to be fun. Even though, you know, for me it's a job, right? This is my job. This is what I do all day, every day. I get up and I go to work by opening my laptop and writing on my story. That is something that you have to enjoy and, and have fun with. And if you allow yourself to have fun, then you'll be able to knock the critics out and you'll be able to finish what you're trying to start. I love it. And I, I would say don't even give them 
don't even poke holes in the lid and give them breathing. No, don't give them air. <laughs> don't give them any air. Yeah. Literally put them in that jar, put the lid on it, and let them suffocate. <laughs> and once they do, you'll be able to work without all of that nagging at the back of your head. Yeah. And it's it's really it's really an important visual exercise to to try. I love it. I do it all the time. I love it. Make them suffer. <laughs> Make watch, them suffer. Watch them squirm. <laughs> Uh, it's better just to put them somewhere you can't see them and you know that they're uh, okay. they can't get out and and it's very freeing i love it and yeah it uh, it frees you up to to just be as you said with your work and all those voices and all those doubts can kind of just you know suffocate and disappear and die yeah tell them to go away i love it jt thank you so much for coming on the show today and for giving us that push Thank you, young man. I appreciate it. I love what you're doing here. Oh, of course. Thank you. And you can find JT on her website, jtellison.com. You can also find her on Facebook, jtellison14. Twitter, she is Thriller Chick. And Instagram, she is jt underscore Thriller Chick. And you can check out her next book, No One Knows, coming out on March 22nd. Everything we discussed today will be in the show notes page. It's the easiest show notes page we've had so far, yourcreativepush.com slash JT. That simple. JT, thank you again so much. Thanks. You have a great day. You too. I had such a fun time talking with JT, and I really hope that it resonated with you, especially if you kind of have decided to take a different job, a different course in your life, but you still kind of get drawn back to your creative desires and you don't quite feel fulfilled by the life that you've created for yourself. And that's probably one of the reasons that you're listening to this podcast. I hope that this episode was able to give you kind of an inspiration to get back to your calling. And the other really interesting thing that really resonated with me was this idea of your loved ones being a part of your creativity or not being a part of your creativity and making sure to explain to them exactly why you're doing this. I had a long conversation with my wife before I decided to take on this monumental task of starting a podcast and not just a a podcast, but a daily podcast. I knew how much work it would require and we talked about it, but then when you're smack dab in the middle of it um, and you're actually doing the work and spending most of your free time doing it, it can be tough. So it's really important to have those lines of communication open so that the other person knows exactly why you're doing it and what it gives to you and what you expect to get from it. And like I said, the the podcast has taken a lot of my time, but it's all been fun time. You know, it's it's been a very enjoyable process. I love being able to help other people and I love the conversations I've been having and just everything that's gone along with this podcast. So it really has given me a sense of fulfillment in my life, uh, which is awesome. But while keeping my full time job, I have very little time to spend with my wife. And the, the funny thing is, one of our moments that we always share is i I put her to bed (laughs) because I work nights, so I get home late, and she has a normal person job, so she wakes up at normal people hours, Um, so she goes to bed before I do while I'm up working on the podcast, so I always tuck her in at night, and uh, JT was kind enough to send me an advanced copy of No One Knows, and for the past week, I've been reading it to her, and (laughs) uh, let's just say that bedtime ends up taking a lot longer than usual (laughs) she keeps she keeps asking what happened to josh we got to find out what happened to josh one more chapter and i just have to say that it is an awesome book so far and uh we're only about 100 pages in now but jt is an awesome writer and you definitely need to get this book Uh, it just came out yesterday so be sure to check that out. You can find it at the show notes page. Again, yourcreativepush.com slash JT, um, or you can just find it on Amazon or her website, jtellison.com. But I highly recommend it. It's great so far, and I can't wait to see what happens. On tomorrow's show, we have Nathan Carson. I didn't allow myself to do the thing that I enjoyed, and here I am, and I'm in New York, I'm in Manhattan, I'm living it up like everyone's jealous of me. And all I want to do is paint these Warhammer miniatures, but I'm still not happy because in my own mind, I'm not an artist yet. So I just allowed myself on the weekends to start painting those Warhammer miniatures. And it poured out of me just for like 18 hours a day in the evenings. During the days, it was all I could think about. And I no longer needed a creative push because I was doing the thing that I loved the most. 
This was a really unique and interesting episode. Nathan was suggested by one of the listeners, and I reached out to him, and we kind of just hopped on Skype right away and just kind of got into his life, and he is doing something very different (laughs) than uh, many of the guests that I've had on the show. So definitely a different viewpoint on creativity and how to utilize it, especially if you are somebody who is either looking to make the leap or you have found yourself in a situation where you have an opportunity to start something new in your life and you kind of have an opportunity to go full force with your creativity, um, whatever that may be. So definitely an interesting episode to end the week. Um, Hopefully today, though, you were inspired to get your work done. So go and get it done. We will be here for you tomorrow if you need the push again. I love you so much, and I love you even more if you get your work done. So go and do it. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.